And so if we, for example, um, get into a situation where, um, well, let's, let me use my favorite, uh, favorite example. One of the biggest problems that we have as uh, fallen people is that we build up resentments against other people. What is resentment? It's a remembrance of wrongs. It's remembering the bad things somebody did to you and, but, and not letting it go. But it's, it's kind of nurturing of hatred, nurturing of a bad feeling. And so what happens? Well, um, say you ha you've developed, you've got this resentment against somebody. Say, say an old girlfriend who dumped you in, in high school. Um, think of all the passions that that hits. Okay, obviously lust, <laughs> your hurt pride, your vain glory. Um, uh, probably, it probably had. Uh, 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 anger, of course. Um, you know, I mean, it just kind of plays on the all the all the all of our weaknesses, right? If somebody really like really hurt you, and and so what happens in our in our brokenness is we is we take all of those things and we start to justify ourselves. In other words, we react to what the person did, or said, or and said. And so we, we decide, well, they're a bad person. Ah, well, they're really not so, really not so attractive anyway. How, you know, and on and on and on and on. And then we start say, telling our friends, well, I didn't like her anyway, you know. She was dumpy, etc. And we start criticizing. Oh, she was ugly. Oh, she was mean. No, she was nasty. And on and on and on. And pretty soon, we have a snapshot of this person in our mind. And as an object which we dislike. And then you have to deal with her in class the next day. <laughs> and all your defenses are up and you don't want to even look at her. Right? And then maybe you say something nasty to her and you know and on you know and you build up all of this uh, this bitterness. And it all comes out of pain. It all comes out of the pain of rejection. And it all comes out of the pain of all the frustration of all of those passions. And from that comes a resentment. Now some of these can last for decades. And, and, and they can become extreme. And uh, sometimes, say if, if it's like a divorce or something like that, um, it can become a defining element of your personality, or of your not a, not just of your personality, of your personhood. You know the whole victim complex, right? And and so every time you even hear about the person or hear the person's name, much less run into them, you start reacting all over the place. You get angry. You you have to criticize them. You have to have to gossip and slander them. You have to have to say all this evil about them. You have to um, avoid them. You have to do all of these things in order to defend yourself from the pain, <laughs> to distract yourself from the pain, and unless. It, it gets dealt with, it becomes too much to deal with. And so what, what can a really advanced state of resentment look like? Um, reactions in, not in proportion 
into uh, into a certain certain kind of stimulus. Say, for example, um, you're in a in a uh, in the grocery store, and all of a sudden, you know, and you see a friend, and and your friend says, "Oh, you know, I just saw." Your ex-girlfriend, and so and so, you erupt into a rage, and you pick something off the table and smash it, or off the shelf and smash it, or do something inappropriate. Resentments are are like cancer in our souls, and one of the one of the one of the fruits of resentment is addictive behavior. Most addictions, especially the abuse of substances, and especially the use of psychoactive substances, whether it's alcohol or drugs, or, uh, and it doesn't matter whether it's prescription drugs that you have a nice prescription for and can justify it, or you don't have a prescription for and you um, uh, acquire otherwise, um, is that it mutes the pain. It distracts you from the pain. Of course, it doesn't heal the pain. In reality, it doesn't even touch the pain. That's why it takes stronger and stronger and stronger substances, because that pain is still seeping through and ruining your life and making you miserable. So instead, what do we do? These self-destructive behaviors. But that's really what's at the. These kind of resentments are at the root of all, almost all addictive patterns. And so the task is, how do we get rid of those resentments? Because one of the one of the fundamental things about resentments is how can we be in communion with God if we bear hatred in our souls? <laughs> how can you even pray the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. <laughs> right? Uh, we're liars. <laughs> right? Makes us liars. We don't need to be liars. It's not spiritually healthy. It's not psychologically healthy either. Resentment is dealt with by only one thing. And this is tough. It's called forgiveness. And that forgiveness can be really hard, especially if you've spent a lifetime justifying your resentment. You know, say you were abused as a child. And you spent your entire life hating your fill-in-the-blank, father, uncle, brother, sister, mother, whatever. And even defined yourself in terms of that resentment. How, many of a, how, many, how, how often does that happen? Very frequently. And so the task is to learn how to appropriately forgive. Now, let me tell you what forgiveness is and what it's not. To forgive means to overlook the sin and see a person for who they are. Because if we resent somebody or... What most often what's happened is that we are so out of touch with the person who is actually there, who is actually in pain themselves, who is actually suffering, partly maybe even because of what they did to us, you know, um, is that we have objectified this person as bad, evil, dangerous. You know, then we use all sorts of, of epithets, you know, you know, abusive, molester, on and on and on and on and on. And, 
And we can neither see that person for who they are. And in reality, the more we get involved in this, neither can we see ourselves. Because what that person did to us is their sin. My reaction to it is my sin. And part of this whole process is about learning how to separate what I am responsible for and what the other person is responsible for. If somebody came up and decked me, that's his sin. What I'm responsible for is the anger, the, you know, the resentment, the pain, the hurt, you know, um, you know, the the string of four-letter words that I used as a result, you know, and on and on and on. But the more that we can come into terms, come to terms with, and accept and own our own reactions, the more control we have over it. Because as long as we are uh, living in a victim mode, we have surrendered all control to the other person. In reality. We've surrendered all control over our inner life regarding this to the other person, which is probably not what we want to do. (laughs) And so the more that we can take responsibility for our own actions, the more that we can be authentically in touch with ourselves, the more we'll be able to forgive the other person. To forgive does not mean to justify their act. It doesn't mean to say it was okay. It doesn't mean to say I deserved it. How many people who are abused think that they deserve it? You know, try and justify the other person. You know, it's this weird codependent thing, you know. Um, If somebody sinned against you, they sinned against you. That's their problem. They need to take it to confession. And ultimately, they need to come and ask forgiveness, if they can. Whether they do or don't, it doesn't matter. But what is most important for ourselves is that we realize is that we understand our own set chain chain of reactions within this and stop it. And simply come to a point where we can say, yes, this event happened in my life without any emotional content to it. (laughs) Okay, and that's the hard part. Because as long as there, we know that we can know that we have not forgiven somebody, if uh, when some negative thing that they have done to us comes up, and and we have an emotional reaction, especially anger and you know bitterness or hatred, the the resentment is still there and it needs to get rooted out. Now. Remember I brought up the example of, uh, of the kid who gets dumped by his girlfriend in high school and all of the passions and all of the, you know, that it touches. Well, you know, what ha- when we're dealing with a resentment, say that that kid is now 40 or 50, <laughs> um, when we deal with a resentment, the best thing that we, we need to do, the most important thing we need to do, is to take it to confession. This is absolutely crucial to have that relationship with a father confessor where we can really, and especially if we can have a spiritual father to whom we can totally bear our souls. That we can take that uh, event in our life and confess, "This this person did this to me, but I became angry. I became 
and raged. I gossiped about him. I slandered him. I, I did these things to him. I, you know, I cut off the relationship. I did all of these things. Repenting of those things. Wanting to get rid of those things. And by the grace of the Holy Spirit, when we confess these things, he takes, he takes, takes away their impact. But sometimes we have to confess things multiple times. And that's because when we confess something, especially something where we had this very, very complex reaction, that in different aspects of our life, maybe what we're only doing is that we're only confessing one little bit of it. It's like, you know, if you have a huge resentment against somebody, it's like a huge tree. Now, you can't take a chainsaw to a huge tree and just right through the, right through the middle of the trunk because it's going to fall on you and crush you, right? That's not how you cut down a huge tree. You have to take the, the branches off, and then you have to take the limbs off, and then you have to take, take down parts of the trunk bit by bit by bit, and then you have to deal with the stump and the roots, and then maybe the suckers that have grown up <laughs> around the... Um. So it's a gradual process. And this kind of healing takes a long time. But it's, but it's an effort that's well worth it. And it's a hu- it is a huge effort. It's something that we have to consciously engage in. And, and keep at the, f- at, at the focal point of our spiritual life for several years before we can cleanse our, cleanse our souls of, of, this, of this bitterness that, present, that prevents us from happiness, from joy, that makes our life miserable. Because it's only through this process that I have seen, anyway, it's the only way that I know of that we can heal the pain that comes from all these various aspects of our lives. Is this clear so far? Okay. Now, how does this... We've got... So you understand about the do not resent part, right? And the do not react part. Because the reactions... When something happens and we react to it, that can create a resentment, right? And so, and so it's a vicious, vicious cycle, vicious circle. You know, the reaction creates resentment, and the and the resentments create reactions, and and so we need to stop that cycle. And part of that is by learning to just say no to ourselves to stop our a reaction in its tracks. You know, um, say somebody cuts you off on the freeway. Okay? This is just very kind of light. You know, probably no, there's, there's probably no, you know, deep content to this, right? Somebody just cuts you off on the freeway. Um, now, if you're in L.A., you're likely to get shot. <laughs> but, um, or the other person is likely to get shot. <laughs> but um, the, how, how do you react to that? Do you fly into a rage? Do you just cuss them out? Do you flip them the bird, you know, or something like that? Or do you, do you allow yourself to become angry? Does it... Oh, that most likely is uh, is a sign of all sorts of buried resentment <laughs> in reality. Or you just say, ah, I better be careful. <laughs> There's some crazy drivers out here. 
you know, no, no emotional content. You see what I mean about the emotional content and about the reaction? Well, it's about learning how to stop ourselves. Learning how to stop, you know, if somebody comes up and punches you, you want to punch them back, right? Well, what if you don't? What if you turn the other cheek? Uh, that'll, what if you do that not only physically, but you don't allow yourself to get angry? <laughs> you don't allow yourself to get angry. It just happens. That happened. No, that doesn't mean you uh, just stand there waiting for more. I mean, you kind of you can hightail it out, you know. <laughs> but um, stopping the emotional reaction is, I believe, an extremely important discipline that we need to engage in as Christians. Because those emotional reactions are exactly the opposite of what, say, the, uh, the epistle was today for St. Her Herman from Galatians. Love, joy, peace, faithfulness, patience, long-suffering. I like to, like to say that you know, long, the problem with long-suffering means you have to suffer a long time. Um, <laughs> long-suffering, <clears throat> self-control. It's that self-control that is, that is what we're after, in order that these other things can dominate us. And that doesn't mean to, you know, say, oh, the guy just punched my lights out, I praise Jesus. You know, that, <laughs> <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's a slightly, that's not exactly the kind of reaction that we need <laughs> either, <laughs> you know. Um, but, Sobriety. Because really what so much of our spiritual life is about is sobriety. And there's two aspects to the sobriety. One is this um, uh, attention to the present. In other words, just being present, not distracted by your thoughts, not distracted by your feelings, not distracted, but just present. And the other is watchfulness. In fact, the title of the Philokalia is the writings of the Holy Neptic Fathers, uh, which means the watchful fathers. And it's this watchfulness over ourself to maintain sobriety this watchfulness over ourself to, so that we do not allow ourselves to react to what's happening to us in a, in a mindless and irrational emotional way, but so that we can respond, if necessary, in a rational and thoughtful way, <laughs> This is, this is like 90% of what the spiritual life is about. And you can see that this spiritual life is not about religion. <laughs> it's not just about religion. It's not about what you do in church. It's about how you react to your office Co-workers. It's about how you react to the kids, it's other kids at school. It's about how you how you interact with the clerk in the supermarket. It's how you interact with your wife and your family. Because <laughs> that's that's where spiritual what spirituality is really all about. I mean, religion religion is is there as a as a means to enable us to live a spiritual life. But there's another aspect of watchfulness, which is kind of where the whole religion thing comes in. 
And that's watchfulness to maintain the awareness of God. One of the fundamental dogmas of, of the Orthodox Christian faith is that God is everywhere present and fills all things, right? We, we begin all of our prayers like that, right? O heavenly King Comforter. God is present everywhere, all the time. We live in the context of God's presence. There's no place where he's, where he's not. You know, I mean, what a, remember the psalm. Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the depths of the sea, you are there. If I go to the heights of the mountains, you are there also. You know, God is present everywhere. In our Anglo-Western culture, we're here, and God is out there someplace, right? He's in heaven, whatever that means. But he's in a separate plane of reality. There's a great book out in Conciliar Press by Father Stephen Freeman, um, uh, who's a priest in the Diocese of the South, called, uh, whoops, I don't remember the title, um, something like God in a Two-Story House, Two-Story Universe. Um, and what he does is he, he is he in in our cultural kind of makeup we think that we think of God as kind of out there as separate from us. It's like God is living in the second story of a house, and we live on the first on the first floor, and he's up there someplace, and there's no stairs in between. <laughs> He's just kind of up there, and he does his thing, and we do our thing. That's the, and as a kind of cultural paradigm of the understanding of God, I think that's pretty accurate. Well, as Orthodox Christians, we say no to that. That God's presence is everywhere, all the time. It's just that we are oblivious to it. And it's by that spiritual awakening, the opening up of our noetic awareness, that God re opens to us the reality of his presence. And most of what the spiritual life is, is about making that awareness the dominant aspect of our consciousness. And that doesn't mean religifying everything. That doesn't mean posting icons everywhere or putting a cross on everything and you know and you know all these rituals and things. I mean, that's okay. You know, there's things there's there's a place for crosses and icons and things. But God is everywhere and in everything, and he's and the whole point of Christianity is that he has come and he's sanctified the entire creation, including us. That's why we're baptized, when we're immersed into, into God, when we're immersed in baptism. We're immersed into the Holy Trinity. <laughs> That's the whole meaning of what baptism is. We're immersed in God. We eat his body, we drink his blood, we become <coughs> him. <laughs> There's never an instant of our existence in which we are separated from God. We just are forgetful. This is a technical term, actually. When the fathers talk about forgetfulness, it's forgetting that God is present. It's not about where you left your keys. It's about remember and the remembrance of God is about remembering that God is present here, now, everywhere. He is present in church, and he's present in the office, and he's present at home, and he's present in your bedroom, and he's present in your kitchen, and even in the attic, <laughs> you know, or in the garage. And you can have a living experience of communion with God in the woods and on the beach as well as in church. Just there's things you, that you can get in church that you can't get in the woods or in, be, in the beach or in the mountains, like communion. 
So all of this ties together. The healing of our souls, the, the forgiveness of those whom we have, for whom we have resentments, which brings us to confession. And what happens in confession? We confess something, and in the absolution, the grace of God is poured into our souls and heals it. It's like light shining into a dark chamber. It illumines the darkness, except it also shows what else is in there. <laughs> and so that's part of this whole process. We have the light, of, the light of, of grace shed into our souls by confessing these things and getting, getting rid of, of, of some of the stuff that we've, that we've got in, this, in the dark corners of our souls. And so we make space and the light shines and we see more stuff to deal with. So we get rid of that and then there's more stuff to deal with. And then we get rid of that and there's still more stuff to deal with. That's okay. That's the process. And it's not quick. It's not quick. But it works. What's, what, but what is important in this process is not only the patience to stick with it, but the willingness to, to do what we need to do in order to do it. And part of that is to learn how to be quiet. It's to learn how to sit in silence and let God work in your soul. Prayer is not about what you say to God. It's not about telling God what to do for everybody. He already knows better than we do. And when we pray for people, and it's really important to pray for people, all we say is, Lord, have mercy on so-and-so. In fact, you can use the Jesus prayer for people. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on so-and-so. But, it, but it's a sure sign of a resentment if you say, on so-and-so the sinner. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't want to do that. <laughs> it's on me the sinner, on so-and-so. And not that so-and-so. <laughs> um, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on my friend. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on this man. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on John or on Mary or on so forth. But that, but prayer, you know, there's intercession. There's all different kinds of prayer. And, but what's going on in all the different types of prayer is that we allow God to work on our souls. We give him permission to come in and to, and to heal us and to transform us. In fact, this is at the very core of what repentance means. You know, as Westerners, we have this, especially growing up in, you know, in a, a basically Calvinist culture, and it doesn't matter whether you were raised Russian Orthodox or Ukrainian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox and and didn't even learn English until you were 20. If you're, in, if you're in, in Canadian or American culture, you know, we're all raised as Calvinists, one way or another, with these kind of Calvinist attitudes, including the God up in the, up in the sky someplace who does his own thing. Um, one, of those, one of those things is, um, is an attitude towards guilt. Because we live in a, in a guilt-based culture. We don't live in a shame-based culture. Japanese culture is shame-based. We live in a guilt-based culture. And we think that by feeling guilty, we're repenting. 
No. <laughs> it's a good thing that sometimes, you know, guilt can be a good positive thing, you know. When healthy guilt is right, when we know we've hurt somebody or done something wrong, uh, we should feel bad about it. But then what do you do with it? Because one of the things that guilt can do is you can build a resentment against yourself. And probably one of the worst epidemics in this entire culture is self-hatred. Self-resentment against ourselves. That's a, that's a tough one. But it's the same thing. What repentance, metania, really means is to paraphrase St. Isaac the Syrian, be transformed in the renewal of your mind. Actually, it's be transformed in the renewal of your noose. It's not dark, it's not guilty, it's not beating yourself up, it's not about feeling horrible about yourself, it's not about you know anything else but being transformed by the grace of God being poured forth into your soul and allowing it to happen. And so what do we do is we turn to God. That's another aspect of repentance. And another translation is conversion. Basically to turn around. Every one of us has to be a convert. In fact, we're not Orthodox Christians unless we're converts. I and everybody knows plenty of people that may have grown up, that you grew up with in the church, who aren't Orthodox anymore, right? But we're here because we're Orthodox by choice. No matter whether it was um, uh, when we, we were baptized at 40 days or whether we were baptized when we were 40 years old, doesn't matter. It's that choice of living a life in God. That's what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. That's what it means to be a Christian. To live our life in, in Jesus Christ. In that living faith, which is not belief about, but rather the conscious experience of communion with God in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. That's what faith is. Beliefs come, belief comes and goes, and sometimes we believe, and sometimes we don't, and sometimes we doubt, and that's healthy. That's actually healthy. It's good. But belief is in the head. It's all part of our rational mind. But faith is noetic Awareness. It's the knowledge of the heart, not of the head. Because sometimes we can believe, we can know with our heart, but our mind is in rebellion. 